All right, welcome back to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. Here with me is Harry Price. And if you haven't subscribed to our show, please do so now and be sure to leave a rating and review while you're there. This segment is brought to you by our Patreon, which you can get at wearelibertarians.com. In this age of frantic communication about hundreds of issues from thousands of voices, it is easy to lose sight of the basic principles of libertarianism. The path to libertarianism exists to keep us grounded in a philosophy that remains a constant in this world of evolving opinion. And this week I wanted to talk about um, Cody Wilson. Okay, so okay. the path to libertarianism this week is about a guy named Cody Wilson and his beliefs and the costs for standing up for them. And uh, he gave uh, this guy is the three 3D printing gun guy that you may have heard a little bit about. Uh, and he gave an interview to Tom Woods, and we're going to play a s some pieces of this and break some of this down because it was fantastic. Um, you know, and so the the what I want to talk about is understanding what you believe and why you believe it. Actually, going through and acting out your beliefs, and then the cost that that may that may cost you if you if you live out those beliefs um i think this interview you have to go listen to it it's in the show notes if you want to listen to the whole thing um but it was a great interview it was episode one one thousand two hundred and twenty four with cody wilson uh of tom woods and i don't know i don't know that there's anything i disagree with but i i just found cody to be the type of person that I respect a lot. Someone who has thought long and deep uh, and hard about their beliefs and has decided that his principles actually mean something and he's going to live those out. And in a lot, and in a lot of ways, I mean, I agree with Cody on everything, but I don't agree with John McCain on a lot. But in a, in a lot of ways, that's why people respect John McCain is because he did the same thing. He thought about those higher values he thought about values that impact society beyond himself, and then he tried to live those out, and it didn't matter what the cost was. Sometimes that cost was good, and sometimes that cost was bad, but at the end of the day, he lived by his principles, and that was truly what mattered. You know, And what we'll hear in this interview is a, a person who understands what they believe, truly appreciates and values free speech, truly appreciates and values the right to own a firearm, a person who understands the importance of an open and free internet. Uh, and and you, you aren't going to hear it in these clips, but Cody Wilson even works with the government to make sure that people are safe and taken care of and helps them. When they have issues about 3D printing of guns, uh, he, he helps answer those questions. He works with ATF and other people on issues because he's like, listen, I don't want crazy people to get this stuff. I don't want terrorists to get this stuff. So I voluntarily work with the government when they have questions. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be like a really like refreshing thing to hear from an anarchist, like not fuck you pigs. Like it was uh, it, nuance. Uh, Gross. Right, right. He was <clears throat> like, I feel that if I create this technology and I put this out into the world, it's up to me to help shepherd it and to make sure that it does fall into the hands of people who deserve to have this this technology. So what do you know about I have never heard of Cody Wilson. I know nothing of Cody Wilson until this interview and I was like smitten. Oh wow. Yeah. Um I remember when Cody Wilson popped up on the scene when he first built the Liberator um, using a, a 3D printer and was shopping that stuff. Explain sucker. that. What is that? Liberator is the um for, like it's the first 3D printed gun like from the ground up just being 3D printed. It it was just it's an untraceable gun in the sense that it wasn't made from a shop. It was just printed out of plastic. The thing that makes the ATF legal is the firing pin that you have to add into it, and you put like a nail in the back of it because it, to be ATF legal inside the United States for a gun, it has to have some metal components so it can pick up by a metal detector. Right. So the firing pin, which will be it, is a nail that you put in the back of it, and it makes it a gun, hmm. a fully functioning gun too. By the way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then Cody, w a lot of people were, uh, but he also did like, a, also traced like the Air 15 lower, you, 3D printer, so you could print that out in plastic. The, then he got in, tr I remember then he got in trouble with that. A lot of people were going after him like that. And then he also helped develop the Ghost Gunner, which is basically, you know, which tries to show people like, hey, technically 3D printing or CAD design or making things with a computer has been around for years. It's called CNC machine. So right. he basically made a CNC machine that 
basically was set up ready to do to finish 80% lower receivers for AR-15s and and build um, uh, 1911s out of solid machine, machine block using CNC technology, which is how they built it. the factories from a lot of different factories. So. Re- <laughs> I, like I said, I, I've looked at Cody. I remember like watching like some Cody interviews. I remember one time when he got the 3D printer. He got it off the the um, the truck, put it in, installed it, started printing on it, and then the company found out what he was doing with it. They sent a truck back and asked for the 3D printer back. Nice. Yeah, I was like, what? They, just, they took it back from you? It's, it's it's insane. Yeah, but sorry. Yeah. No, no sorry, apologies yeah. necessary. Did you know that he created Hatreon? I did not. What? So, so when uh, Lauren Southern and some other people got kicked off of Patreon, mm-hmm. uh, he he set up this site called Patreon. Mm-hmm. I knew of Patreon. I knew when he did it. And so it was a Patreon like system. Mm-hmm. So if you want to see how Patreon works, you can go to Patreon dot com slash We Are Libertarians, mm-hmm. and it's basically a way for you as a content creator to financially support your work. And so all these guys kept getting kicked off, like Richard Spencer, and he created a platform for these people to to, and then Visa eventually shut them down, and said forget it. And so once Visa or Mastercard says no, you're done. Um, and somebody actually sent me the link to Patreon and said you should use this because it, it was a year ago when I was looking for an alternative, mm-hmm. and I took one look at it. I was like, nope, <laughs> like, <laughs> just what I need my my audience to go and like. I'm not gonna sign up on a site that has Richard Spencer next to it, you know. And so, and so I was very against Patreon, mm-hmm. and and I don't think I'm not against it, but I I totally get what he's saying in the later clip. Um, so here's a guy who does a lot of stuff that, like, from the outside, if he, if he were reported on, you'd go, what a whack job, what a alt-right troll, what a blah, blah, blah. But when you listen to this interview, he's incredibly bright. Mm-hmm. He is, um, I'm really pissed he's handsome, too. Um, and he's just somebody that I, I think is a good role model for people. Uh, and so I want to play the first clip on his influences. Now, we're not going to pull any clips about the gun stuff or how he does any of that. You can go listen to Tom Woods, give him that download, listen to all that. I just pulled a few minutes of this that I think are relevant. So this is Tom Woods talking to uh, Cody Wilson on the Tom Woods show. Play. Do something. All right, well... Apparently, we're not going to play this clip uh, because you're being a dick computer. Uh, I hate a dick computer, don't you? Mm-hmm. Is that an Apple that you're using there? Yeah, but I don't think it's the Apple's fault. I think it's the computer's fault. So, Which is an Apple, right? right. No, it's uh, Adobe's fault. Too. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, just, you know, just, yeah. <sighs> so, Harry, how's your week going? <laughs> going good, going good. Do you need to put that on your stream deck with a push button there? Yeah, I think that's probably what I'm going to have to do here. Oh, or maybe yeah. I'll get into the Trello here. I've got it there, too. Oh, I've got cool. it everywhere. Yeah. I have, like, I have a, like 15 different places should something go wrong. So, yeah. well, What are your influences, like philosophical influences? And by the way, we're very open-minded here on the Tom Wood Show. It's okay if they're not all Murray Rothbard. I'm just curious. About, oh, I know that. You know, I know what, that. what made you Cody Wilson? You've... Uh... I've seen you get raked over the coals the last year too, man. Oh, you know, we all got. <laughs> and I liked how you stand up for it. You know, unfortunately, at the end of the day, a lot of us, from a really committed point of view, will will be tested this way by the I don't know the quavering emotivists of our uh, quote unquote movement. I, I used to consider myself a movement libertarian when I was in college and stuff. I, Ron Paul and CPAC and all this stuff. I you know, and, and of course you, Tom. I, my my co-founder of Defense Distributed, Zach Cuban, was a huge Tom Woods fan when we were in school and we would go by, you know, and get your books and stuff at the little tables at CPAC, and, you know. Uh, so you've been on my radar a long time. I could say to some degree you're a, an influence of mine because, you know, there's a Christian element uh, to your life and elite elite academic institutions, you know, that provide aspirational motivation for people who want to maintain a, a connection to conservative philosophy and their libertarian activism and, so I'd say that you're in there, by the way. Uh, well, I appreciate um, that. I, I wasn't fishing for that, just so you know, but I do appreciate <laughs> it. No, no, I know you weren't. Um, but for me, though, the, the the defining, the kind of landmark moments in my philosophical exposure were Hoppe. Hoppe was a big thing for me. And, of course, before he was particularly, like, I don't know, contaminated in the current discourse. Of course, that doesn't bother me at all. But um, I had critical theory, and, and then I found Baudrillard. And I would say, like, those are the, 
the high water marks for me for all my all my look. I don't I don't want to unpack it all, but basically, like uh, Bogiard has a his late theory is his fatal theory. Like this stuff is directly what I do. I just try to kind of live out Bogiard's charges to people, which are that like every project you have should be an analogy for something. It should contain elements of play and challenge. It should invite the element of chance. Um, this might all sound kind of cartoonish to you, but, uh, I, I treat it with deadly seriousness. <laughs> yeah. I, we can go any, any direction you want there, but that's, that's about it for me. I, I spent some time with the Austrians. And I discovered Hoppe. Um, I'm quite favorable to the post-Marxist discourse once, once the leftists finally shake away leftism. And then now we, we see people like Telos Press at Stanford University and, and I'm comfortable at least having conversations with these, uh, these, neo-reactionaries who are discovering the kind of post-left and post-right, post-democratic politics of the future. So I don't think you need to have a whole list of, uh, <clears throat> you know, like names like that. And you don't certainly have to fall down the rabbit hole that maybe he did. But what you hear in that clip is somebody who has read widely or when asked can answer the question, who were your greatest influences in your thinking? Who helped form your values? And what are those values that you live by? What are the things that motivate you to wake up in the morning? What is your purpose for living? What is your purpose for doing a task? And what I love about that clip is that he he has thought down to every element of why he does what he does. And, and I can tell you as somebody who is very ambitious and somebody who is very motivated myself, uh, everything to me is has to have a higher purpose. There has to be some uh, element of, uh, you know, it's, 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 it, I just don't want to waste my time. I mean, we have such limited time and I'm 30, I'll be 35 in a couple weeks. And it's like, you know, I'm, I could be middle aged. I could be three quarter aged you know, or I could be, you, you never know. And 35 years went so quickly and I'm already starting to feel age and I'm starting to slow down and not, not have the same memory I did. And it's like, I want to maximize every piece of time that I have left. And so every day I want to go to bed exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally. And I want to, I, I want to experience life and, and contribute to our national conversation a, through a voice that is different than anybody else's. Nobody is out there combining empathy and you know Christian thought and libertarian thought and news analysis and doing what we're doing and, there, and I think through every single part of what we do at we are libertarians you know and so I identified with somebody who has identified the moments in their thought that were impactful to them that then thought out why they do what they do and then thought how can I impact the world according to those values you know, and I, I certainly am not as clear as that, and I certainly don't think that uh, I'm as motivated as that. But that is somebody that I heard I was that was aspirational for me, um, and so it 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 was something that I wanted to play for you guys because I think it is important for every one of our listeners to understand why you think the way you think, understand who shaped your thinking and why, and then ask are those the appropriate people to shape the way you think? Let's say you were influenced by John McCain. What parts of John McCain influenced you? Was it the part of the man who um, was completely honest all the time and when he wasn't honest, he apologized for it? Or was it the part that where he thought that using the force of government and putting a gun to somebody else's head was an appropriate use of his value, was an appropriate value to have? Um and so I would I would say that John McCain was somebody in 2000 that I was very I wanted him to win that primary, but by 2008 I was like nope nope <laughs> because I had a fundamental shift in my values and in my thinking. So understand who shaped your thinking, understand why you think what you think, and then start examining from those principles and values your actions, your behavior your daily life, your daily tasks. Um, today was one of the rare times where, uh, you know, to me, family is important and extended family is important. Uh, I grew up in a large extended family until 15, 13 to 15, basically my nuclear and extended family disappeared through death, divorce, 
uh, relocations. And so I went from having a large, loving family to uh, to having uh, not much family. <laughs> and so when I, I I make sure to see my nieces once a week or talk to them on the phone or and so I was invited to see them for dinner tonight and I didn't go. And it's one of the rare times where I violated that that principle and value. But it mm. doesn't matter who or what, and it's because I it was going to con- inconvenient Harry, and I'm going to see them in a few days. You know what I mean? So there, so it's the trade off. But that principle is really important to me to the point that I will cancel a lot of stuff. And there have been times where I have not been consistent with the show because I was seeing them, and it is more important for me to to be a part of my niece's lives who are two and four than it is to fulfill my duties at, at here, mm. you know, or at work. Even mm-hmm. my nieces are two of the most important people in my life. So, you know, and it's because I was, I was shaped in a good way and then by, in a bad way by extended family and the role that that plays in somebody's life. So that's an example of understanding what is important and the priorities that exist in your life. And so, Harry, like, if I ask you, what are the foundational moments in your in your political thinking? May not jump into your life, but if 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 it relates, mm-hmm. you know, we all can kind of identify those impactful people in life. But if I asked you, like, who are the impactful thinkers in your life that led you to libertarianism, and what values did they impress upon you? What would you say? Mm. I used to like be able to rocket this answer off and go to it. Be, but a lot of it from comes from different readings of different times and different places. To be perfectly honest, um, a lot of it from just reading of a lot of. Um, I'm in, but the place I'm at, firstly, like from a, from a Stanford, just from reading a lot of Frederick Douglass, mm-hmm. and I've read a, which has helped me out a whole lot to judge. Of, from where for just politically speaking it was like uh, Frederick Douglass, Thomas Sowell and also reading other different books um, I cannot remember the authors but the, the book The the Assassin, Harrison Bergeron um, and um, Fahrenheit, um, Fahrenheit 4, uh, yeah, 451 Right. those books shaped me and also I think the biggest thing that and you guys can give me crap for it to want but a space opera aka Gundam, the Gundam series and anime series, helped shape me politically. A lot of the things that I go back to, a lot of the things that I know, like is the foundation of a lot of the ideas that I will think about, especially politically thinking, I can trace back to watching Gundam as a kid. Hmm. Yeah, for me, it was Healing Our World by Mary Ruart. Okay, because I've never fit in with the Misesian crowd. Mm. <laughs> I I don't like economics. I don't. It's hard for me to understand economics. It's like Einstein when they examine his brain, the math part of his brain was two hundred percent larger. Mine's two hundred percent smaller. Mm. So it, economics is just not something that I'm crazy about. That's why. Um, what's the book? It's up here on the shelf here. Uh, how an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes by Peter Schiff was so helpful because it had so many pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and it helped me to understand uh, economics a lot better. But Mary Ruart's book, Healing Our World, uh, was like a lightning bolt to me in 2013. And I mean, I had been a libertarian by that point uh, for five, six years at, at most. But that that was the first time that I saw libertarianism could be an empathetic philosophy. Hmm. And it spoke to me in a way that was very impactful because all of the sudden, you know, and Ron Paul was a lightning bolt in 2007 or 2008 in those debates when I saw him talk about foreign policy. And that's when I went, oh, I get it. I'm a libertarian. I understand the foreign policy stuff. I have no excuse not to join this party or to be part of this movement, you know. And then for me, the the. um the reading of Mary's book in 2013 when I discovered it, it was like, wow, you can combine empathy and loving people with libertarianism. It's actually a very empathetic, it's the antithesis in a lot of ways of Ayn Rand and the way that people, they position libertarianism. You know, and then hearing Marshall Fritz and that and that clip especially that I just played, and, and if you go back in the We Are Libertarians subscriber feed, and the podcast feed, you'll find What is a Libertarian by Marshall Fritz, 
or the basics of libertarianism with Marshall Fritz. And the reason that's in our feed is that was so impactful to me in 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 articulating the the values an extension of our values is libert that is libertarianism and so marshall and uh working for the advocates for self-government was just i got to spend a year working for the marketing arm of the libertarian movement as their marketing guy mm -hmm. trying to uh come up with a you know you take the quiz online and then my goal was to basically craft some sort of pipeline to take Hitler to libertarian in two minutes, mm. you know, and that goal is uh, something that I will eventually achieve. Uh, <laughs> the The output of that year of work is actually the path to libertarianism at wearelibertarians dot com. So just go go to uh, wearelibertarians dot com slash libertarianism, and you'll find some of the the thinking that I put in that year. But it was just basically a year of me studying libertarianism and how do you message it quickly and easily in a way that regular people get. Uh, and it was so instructive uh, instructive to me um the 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 next part of this interview is what what is uh maybe not this part yet let's go to to this part why does cody wilson no i'm going to go to the cost part okay so living out your values sometimes there will be a cost you know in, in christianity it is often said that you know it's it's hard to live the christian lifestyle in a world of sin and it and it is trust me i mean that's it's why christians fail all the time um but you know when you when you believe anything strongly you're going to pay a cost for that uh be it a personal cost be it uh friends family be it money be it job opportunities um any time you stand for something there's going to be a cost People pleasing is easy, but being firm in your beliefs is not. And uh, so, this is some of the, some of what has what it has cost Cody the incredible financial and personal cost of believing in what he believes in. Where do things stand for you, and how people can help you? Well, <laughs> I I ran one lawsuit for many years, mostly out of my own pocket, and now I'm being sued. It's lawfare. It's pure lawfare. I'm, I'm being sued in four different federal venues across the country. I'm being sued by the Pennsylvania Attorney General in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. How can a state bring a federal claim like this? I, I don't know. But, you know, you still have to go to court for years about it, even so. I'm being sued in New Jersey State Court by the New Jersey Attorney General, who would dare to make the claim that hosting a website in Texas somehow violates New Jersey state law. What else? And then 21 states are suing me in Washington. And uh, this is that attorney general who sues Trump every single time Trump does something. So I'm, I'm caught up in the, uh, the great production of Trump law out there in the Ninth Circuit now. So I know that I'm going to get kicked around the Ninth Circuit for ages, even though, again, these states can't even prove that they have Article Three standing for this controversy. So it's a beautiful thing where like, I'm actually in a, a position of real strength from the law everywhere you look. But that won't prevent me from having to spend years and blood and fortune and everywhere you look. So I have a, I have a fundraiser at defcad.com and, um, I'm going for two weeks right now. I'm getting private commitments and public commitments. I think I can, I can fund it for the next couple of years. No problem. Just, just by the end of the month, if uh, everyone's involved and we'll spread the word and spread the video, the stakes couldn't possibly be higher because these people have just decided, look, we're, we're going to say that there's no first amendment value in any type of computer aided code, right? Any type of design file, like Nope, no First Amendment protection. Because if, if you could use a computer to create a shape of a gun, well, then I'm sorry, that's unacceptable. And we have to prove that, that code isn't speech so that we can control what you do with a computer. And that's that's literally where these people are. So stakes couldn't be higher from a digital libertarian point of view. So is there any is there any point where you say this is overwhelming and I just have to throw in the towel? Or is it is it manageable? Mm, I don't know. I mean, uh, I hate to say it this way, but... I wouldn't be any kind of man if I hadn't had the original challenge. Like when I made the printed gun, I was immediately challenged and threatened for prosecution by the, the Obama State Department. That was a huge thing to fall on my head when I was just kind of one guy. And that enormous challenge is what made me have to build a manufacturing company and become responsible and meet a payroll, right? Like I had to find half a million dollars. No one's just going to give that to you. You have to produce it. And so as perverse as it sounds, 
I actually am welcoming of this challenge. I, I think it can easily destroy me and bankrupt me, but I like the idea that maybe I could become excellent enough to, to also defeat this. You know, I guess I was maybe conceiving of this the wrong way. I was thinking, look, this information is already out there. There's nothing they can do about that. Well, what are they going to do, really? How, how are they going to stop this information from being spread? But what they can do is make your life miserable. And I, I discounted that, I think. Well, I mean, thank you for saying so. And I, again, I don't want people to be greatly like, I don't know, uh, sad for me. Like I've got a fighting chance and I get the fights that I asked for, right? I certainly invited this challenge in some way. All these states accepted the fight on my own terms. They got so mad because uh, I was out there in the press with a picture of, you know, a headstone with the words gun control on it. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not just going to sit there and accept this symbolic challenge. And this is actually part of my activism. I understand that they won't. And it leads to overreach and it leads to desperate knee-jerk reactions where, again, like the claims that they've made are, and I'm sorry, but piss poor, right? These aren't even, these aren't even intelligible legal claims in these many venues. And I think that there's every room for them to be, oh, there's every opportunity for them to be corrected and for me to be vindicated and, and for the glory to be greater. But, um, you still have to, you still have to survive the initial nuke from orbit, you know? So there's a guy who is, uh, I like that he is seeing these challenges. I mean, I think most people would look at these challenges and go, this is a, nope, nope, not, not, not anymore. Not going to do it. Uh, don't want to be a part of this. Uh, I'm just going to go live with my family and uh, be happy. And, you know, and he's like, you know what, this is going to stretch me. This is going to make me a better person. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the scary thing about that, uh, the whole uh, talking about this thing, when they're talking about going after the computer, is essentially they are doing the same thing to do with Bitcoin and cryptography, is they're out going to try and outlaw math. Right. And if they could get him and not say this isn't the First Amendment, then they'll use that to go after, who knows, cryptocurrency, cryptography in general period just be having the ability to hide behind a vpn hide behind um you know ssl certificate scale uh, proxy socks and so the government can see everything you know you can't do that we can outlaw that now right it's the exact same type of math that they're going to try to outlaw or saying who can control or who cannot control cnc machines or printing machines and holding back more of this printing technology it's worse now that you know a lot of technology is being held back just because of the copyright and patent trolls. That's not what they're coming after them yet. They're coming after them this way, right? You know, which I can't. It, like these, he says these are like fights he can win. Yeah, but it's what I'm more worried about is the patent trolls coming after him, it? right? So, so then this is a little bit of a longer clip, but this is explaining why he actually does what he does. Well, to boost my post on Facebook. I can't advertise. Uh, he's basically asked by Tom Woods, uh, you know, what do you think of these platforms? So he, he's giving an answer about how he gets the word out and how he raises money to piggyback off that last question. Uh, and so he's asked, you know, how do you, how do you get the word out? And then he kind of gives these, I just thought it was fascinating how he's been silenced and yet he still, he still operates and thrives. Really able to boost my post on Facebook. I can't advertise uh, on any significant or major channels. Uh, I can't use most payment processors. I've been thoroughly banned on wow, most platforms wow. over the years. Um, that's just how it is, right? Now, of course, it doesn't prevent me from acting, but it certainly limits my reach. So I have to, I have to wait on these moments like where the mainstream media comes to me. And I've done okay with that. You know, I've, I've survived with these, this weird cycle, this weird method. So I trust it. And, uh, but let me ask you about I, that. I, but let me ask you about mm -hmm. that particular thing. I mean, I think people are maybe tired of talking about social media and the I mean, censorship's a weird word in this situation. But but deplatforming and all that. And I'm sure you've had plenty to say about it. But how do you feel about that? I mean, you're you're a technology guy, mm. but you're not involved in building alternative platforms. Do you think alternative platforms are the way forward, or fighting well, to elbow you your way into the old ones, or what? Uh, it's, I actually did build an alternative platform last year for people that were kicked off of, um, the website, Patreon. And, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Patreon, but that's, that's I, a way that I you can make money. I don't use it. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Have, like, I have my own thing that I can't be kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. I, uh, I built the service called Patreon. You for, uh, built that? 
<laughs> that was me. Yeah. You're, you're crazy, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now listen, I built that though for you know a distinct a distinct reason. I needed to both understand how to you know maintain the right payments relationships and and undergo the, the extreme hosting challenges of something like that, right? Where you're going to be actively attempted to be hacked and brought down every day. And I I did that for about six months. It was very very hard, but I actually learned a lot of lessons. And I was proud that I was able to stand up for the speech interests of all these people, even even villains like Richard Spencer and Andrew Anglin. I, I was certainly grateful that I could I could send the money and help them, you know, reach their audience and stuff. In the end, it wasn't enough because uh, Visa itself shut us down. So you can't really, you know, it's like God God pronounced that we couldn't do it. So I think there's certain platforms that just can't be built in the current environment. Um, there's, you know, you'll just be terminated by your own success. But yeah, if, if anyone. If anyone's motivated enough, I think you can maintain, but what you can you, find yeah, But what would you say? Could, wouldn't there be some way you could do that with cryptocurrency? Yeah, but the, the big thing in crypto right now is that there aren't pull, there isn't really pull technology. And a lot of these people simply want a platform that they can have reliable income, you know, on a subscription basis. And um, a lot of this can't really be built in crypto right now. You can remind people every month to send you money, but a lot of people want to set up automatic processes. You know how it is this is reliable, something that you can count on next month. And, you know, a credit card authorization vaulted in a, in a web app is like, it's much more, you know, that's the, that's the brass ring right now. What about people who say, but look, Cody, these people are toxic and they're trying to spread terrible ideas and, you know, yeah, yeah, we're all in favor of free speech as long as they're talking about the weather or something, but, but we don't want that ah, kind of that's speech. That's a good point. Yeah. There it is. There it is. You know what? Yeah, everybody's brave to protect free speech when it's useless speech or inoffensive. I'm I'm inspired by different moments in living memory for me, like Christopher Hitchens' great defense of Holocaust denial and everything. Why? Not because he is a Holocaust denier, but because he would he would never he would never give I don't know credit to a, a regime of law which could which could penalize you for denying the facts. You know, it's it's a I don't, I don't, it's so distasteful to even consider laws like hate speech laws and Holocaust denial laws. And, you know, this just isn't, this, these aren't the fruits of the enlightenment. Of course, some people in the philosophy would say like, uh, yes, it is. And this is why the enlightenment, you know, must be abandoned. But, uh, I, I like to both have direct engagement with, uh, the panoply of extremist ideas, right? Like, I mean, I've met Assange in the embassy. Do you know what I mean? Like I've, I've been with, uh, I try to, I try to have a Congress with, anybody doing like important things or at least being at like the edge of the things that I care about, you know, speech and, and printing and, and all this stuff. But, uh, look, all I can say is that like, I actually do have a, a deep care for, you know, the English, the English experience of, of free speech and that tradition, like the intro to the age of reason and, you know, like the, the rights of man, like all this, this discourse, this matters to me. And like when CNN would come interview me about Patreon, all I would give them, I would give them these quotes, right? And they'd be like, oh my God, how can you want to believe that? But all I was doing was recycling Tom Paine, right? Like I was just giving them like Blackstone and like th things that were, uh, you know, the, the noble expressions of like English Republicanism <laughs> from, you know, hundreds of years ago. And of course I see a brief, like, like I have in Washington state where these state attorney generals are attacking me and they go, Cody Wilson is a crazed anarchist. He believes that. And then they quote me, he believes that government should fear the people. Okay, well, that's simply an apocryphal Jefferson quote, right? Like we're this far from the shore that like I can repeat American republicanism uh, and its antecedents and be called a radical in federal court. I thought that last part, that was like something that I've always known, but it, it just in that moment, the specific application of a person defending the right to free speech mm -hmm. in court repeating Thomas Paine and then being called a radical by our current government just hit me like a ton of bricks. I went, Thomas Jefferson is illegal. Yeah. George Washington is illegal. Mm -hmm. And we now serve under King George. Yeah, pretty much. And we've had for years. Yep. And it's... It, it, it's... It's it's the one reason why I used to tell people on the older podcast that you know, for the 4th of July, like I said, like, the best thing you do is read the Declaration of Independence. Just read it. Yep. Just read it. And think of that and think of today. And just, just look at that for a second. Right. You know? You know, like, it's the, you know, and then a lot of things you even look at it, like, even if you believe in this type of system, a lot of the things are ridiculous. Even today. It's just yeah. ridiculous. 
um, because there's you know the spans of between someone who lives in Portland, Oregon, versus being ruled by people who lived in who live in D.C. thousands of miles. Mm-hmm. What say do those people have over you know what you do in Oregon, right? Or what do you know? Just the same way people in in Indiana have you know who do these people out you know in dc or california say what i had to do i want my freaking straw with my drink okay right well and i think we get hung up on it's hard to understand what's going on with cody wilson and why it's important that you should be allowed to print a 3d gun and the the implications of the federal government owning code uh and owning the the right to regulate or destroy code Right. And code being free speech. I mean, the implications of this are really in- enormous, mm-hmm. and we don't understand it. And we spend a lot of time talking about flags being raised and lowered as the, if that's the great moral outrage of our time, whether or not Donald Trump put a flag at half mast. Mm-hmm. No, the fact that the federal government has outlawed Thomas Paine or that you can't speak freely through code on the internet mm-hmm. or that Raytheon and and American bombs are killing toddlers in Yemen, those are the great moral outrages of our time, not whether or not a piece of fabric is hanging at half or full staff. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, they want to outlaw math. They're not teaching a great in public school, but they will sure outlaw it the best they can. And the thing is, they're going after Cody Wilson because he's one of the loudest and outspoken, and they made it easier for the masses. But any one of you can get on eBay right now, purchase a aluminum CNC machine, and do the exact same thing as a 3D printed gun, but with metal. The other thing is, you can make zip guns. People have it's okay for you to make guns here in the United States. People have made guns here in the United States all the time. What Ruger and you know Walther and Glock, what they're doing in their you know labs, you know, not nothing you can't do if you don't have the right machining tools. Who can you know? It, capitalism or the free market or the market in general has made these prices uh, made this machining equipment incredibly inexpensive and yes you can purchase this stuff as a home it's more of the government being face to face with this and then a lot of these people are understanding that wow there is no magic between you know creating these weapons there's no magic to it yeah you know it's not like this laptop there's so many different people, so many different businesses, so many tech to go into this. Nope, this is pretty much, uh, you know, it's an easy, simple tool. You could probably make this all yourself. All it is is a cartridge loaded into a pressure chamber and you know, a pin that fires the little primer in the back of it. That's it. That's all we're doing here. It's not rocket science. Well, technically kind of is, but no, it's not rocket science. So uh, district judge extends claim to have repealed First Amendment. Uh, the, that was Thomas Knapp's uh, headline. A U.S. judge on Monday extended a ban on the online distribution of 3D printed gun blueprints, a win for a group of mainly Democratic-led states that said such a publication would violate their right to regulate firearms and endanger their citizens. So this is an update. Uh, let me reread that. A win for a group of mainly Democratic-led states that said such a publication of these plans would violate their right to regulate firearms. Do you know the Second Amendment by heart? You shall not (laughs) regulate a well-armed militia? Um, U.S. U.S. Dick Judge uh, Robert Lasnick in Seattle issued the extension of a nationwide injunction blocking a Texas-based group from disseminating files for printing plastic weapons on the Internet. LASIK's prior order, issued on July 31st, blocked the release of the blueprints hours before they were set to hit the Internet. That temporary ban was set to expire on Tuesday, and the new ban will remain in place until the case is resolved. (laughs) So this is going to go to the Supreme Court, and uh, they make it about guns, and that's why Cody does it that way, uh, because it's outrageous, Mm -hmm. and it's easy to persuade people to think one way about something that is dangerous and could fall into the hands of extremists and blah, blah, blah. But that's that's the point. You defend the right of extremists because those are the people that they come for first. I mean, you look at the crackdown on conspiracy theorists on the Internet— I'm sorry, but when the most powerful people in our government and our media and in our business sphere and our society say, you shouldn't listen to these people that question us, I start to go, hmm, Hmm. who are you, the powerful, to tell me, the little guy, that I'm not allowed to question you Mm -hmm. or the very existence of nature itself? Right. 
the idea that you can't question events or even question facts, as as he talked about with Christopher Hitchens, or existence, the existence of reality. Mm-hmm. These are you cannot outlaw outlaw thinking. And what happens when you start to outlaw speech is people have these thoughts, mm-hmm. and they express those thoughts to try and re- gain control of their thoughts and understand the context of their thoughts and work these things out. And so if you actually want to correct bad behavior, you let people speak freely and you have conversations with them and you come to uh, uh, an agreement on reality, I guess, and then their mind changes from thinking crazy thoughts like Sandy Hook didn't happen to, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Because of conversations. But if you never allow those conversations to happen, minds never change, behaviors never change. So the as I wrote this weekend for my column on WeAreLibertarians.com, the way to solve Alex Jones' bad behavior is through open speech. It's not through silencing him or censoring him. All you do is dr- you send people underground and outlaw their thinking. It's you can't prohibit you can't prohibit words and thoughts the same way uh, that you can prohibit. Alcohol. No, no, you, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I, that didn't work. No, that didn't work. Oh, but, oh, she's yeah, all right. That went terrible, by the way. Idiots. You know, I just I can't take it. Yeah. 